Let's read it, and then we're going to pray. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 20 says, He who heeds the word wisely will find good, and who, whosoever trusts in the word, uh, trust in the Lord, happy is he. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for prayers answered. We thank you for these folk that are here. Be our preacher and our teaching. We'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Constitution of the United States guarantees the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to find out that there's not a lot of happiness being spread around in America today, in the world today. The American Public Health Association reports that unhappy, ineffective, upset persons make up about one-third of the population in the United States. That's a lot of people that's unhappy, that's frustrated, that's ineffective. If these statistics are even approximately correct, America is in deep trouble. With each passing day, we are discovering that in the age in which you and I live, conditions are becoming worse instead of better. We represent 6% of the world's population, and we take 90% of the world's tranquilizers. Did, did you get that? America represents 6% of the world's population, and we take 90% of the world's tranquilizers. The truth of the matter is we are a nation of miserable human beings. Americans today make more money, have better houses, eat better food, drive better cars, enjoy more opportunities than any other generation. And yet we are pursuing happiness frantically, something to swallow, something to sniff, something to smoke, something to spend money on. In fact, the search for happiness itself winds up being one of the chief causes of our unhappiness. The more knowledge we acquire, the less wisdom we seem to have. The more economic security we attain, the more corruption we seem to generate. The more pleasure we enjoy, the more disenchanted we get. We become with ourselves or with our spouses or with our children or with our destiny. Most folk will agree that we are in need of a transfusion of spiritual and moral energy in our sick society. So I guess the first question as we begin this series is, we need to ask ourselves, what is happiness? <clears throat> well, I'm pretty sure a sick man would say happiness is health. An ambitious man would probably say happiness is success. A poor man would probably say happiness is wealth. A scholar would probably say happiness is learning and a man who works 60 to 80 hours a week would say happiness is rest and relaxation. But none of these things produce lasting happiness in our lives. Happiness is not something that's haphazard. That is, happiness doesn't come our way by accident. People who think happiness is accidental, that it kind of drops out of the sky like rain or snow, uh, they sometimes forget that even rain and snow is not accidental. It is given by the hand of God. So as we seek to find happiness in the next weeks ahead, there is one truth that we need to remember. Nothing that comes from the outside can satisfy the soul on the inside. And I want to say that again because I want you to get that. Nothing that comes from the outside can satisfy the soul on the inside. Happiness is not an environment, uh, a product of our environment, but a state of condition of our spiritual and mental process. I want you to know that we're going to tie those two together. Happiness is a part of the process of our spiritual and mental process. Real happiness is not a product of our pleasant surroundings, but is generated by a happy condition which already exists in our heart. Happiness is not something that we carry in our hands. Happiness is something that we carry in our heart. In other words, our state of happiness is the result of an inward spiritual atmosphere which always remains constant and unchanging in the midst of an ever-changing and unpredictable atmosphere 
that's going on around us. Therefore, no matter, now I want you to nail this down. If you don't get anything else I say tonight or in this series, no matter what your outward conditions might be, we always have an unchanging relationship with God that governs our ventral being. Okay? Whatever's going on in your life, however emotionally upset or physically upset or whatever it is, however, however emotionally wounded you are, always remember this, God hasn't changed. He's still God. And He still loves you. And He still promised to meet your need according to His riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So if you are allowing Satan to destroy you emotionally because of some outward circumstance, then that's your fault. That's not God's fault. So I stand before you tonight to proclaim the time to be happy is today. The time to be happy is right now, tonight, in this place. The place to be happy is right here where you are. He said, well, preacher, you don't understand. You don't understand what I'm going through. I don't understand what you're going through. But I know, I know God. And I know God made this promise that he would never leave us nor forsake us. Is that, is that what he says in your Bible? Sure it does. But first of all, we need to begin by <coughs> understanding what happiness isn't. All right? I guess the truth of the matter is that, that we all pursue happiness. It just comes naturally. We want to be happy. We want to be loved. We want to be accepted. We want to be, have this happy feeling in our life. The problem is we keep looking for it in the wrong places. It's like the old country western song. We look for love in all the wrong places. Well, we look for happiness in all the wrong places. <clears throat> Let me tell you, <clears throat> the very first place and probably the very worst place that we look for happiness is in religion. Happiness is never found in religion. Therefore, we need to distinguish between religion and Christianity. Religion is nothing more than a pretense of godliness held together with the glue of idolatry, rituals, rules, and the traditions of men. That's all religion is. Religion is a form without force. It is ceremony without change in conduct or character. It thrives on human traditions that exclude the commandments of God. Religion is rich in tradition, but poverty-stricken where love and joy and peace are concerned. Tradition is a religious rut. Ruts are easy to follow. All you got to do is just follow what's in front of you. You have to work to get out of a rut. Did you know the more you stay in a rut, the deeper it gets? Years and years ago, when I was a sprout, that was three days after dirt, we had, uh, my, my daddy had a, um, um, I think it was a Model A Ford, and he bought it new. But we lived out, way out in the country. We lived about 16 miles or so out in the country, and we didn't, we had dirt roads. We didn't have asphalt. And uh, in, the, in the spring and winter and summer, whatever the rainy seasons were, you would drive up and down those dirt roads and you, you drove in the same ruts because if you didn't, you would slide off in the ditch. And the more you drove, the deeper the ruts got until if you wasn't careful, the bottom of that thing was dragging the ground because the ruts were so deep. Now, here's the problem. If you met somebody else, one of you had to bite the bullet because somebody had to get out of the ruts because the same ruts that went this way are the same ruts that came this way. And, and I remember uh, 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 we were going someplace one time, and I had an uncle that was coming down the road uh, the opposite from where we were going, and my daddy had to put that thing in reverse and back up until he could find a place to 
to get out of the way for the uncle, my uncle to come on down by him. So you say, what does that have to do with us? That's exactly where some of us are. The longer you stay in the rut of tradition, the deeper it gets and the harder it is to get out of it. And uh, so tradition is a religious rut. What God wants to do is a new work in our life. He wants to do a new work in our church. He wants to do a new work in my life, in your life. This is what, preacher, you don't understand. I've been saved since old Buck was in the army. That's good. That's good. Chances are you probably got over it. Huh? Yeah. You know, the, you know the saddest thing that I found in Christian life is people are getting over being saved. You ought never, ever, ever to lose the joy, the excitement, the expectancy of knowing that you're a child of the living God. Saved by faith in Christ on your way to glory. Sealed and had your sins charged to the cross. Man, that's good stuff right there. That ought to cause you to want to do something. So if you're stuck in a rut, let me tell you something. You're going to miss the new work God's got for you. Tradition holds on to the past. Tradition resists change, but the path leads to spiritual maturity and happiness demands change. You can't, if you're doing the same thing you've always done, you're going to get the same results you've always got. It's just that simple. <clears throat> when Jesus healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath, Enraged, the Pharisees approached him and fists clenched and teeth grinding, screaming, we have a tradition, you can't heal on the Sabbath day. In their religiosity, they were prepared to let a man remain crippled just simply to preserve their tradition. Jesus asked this searching question in Matthew chapter 15, verse 3, why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition?" Tradition stunts spiritual growth. It destroys the adventure of faith. It splashes, squashes the fresh move of the Holy Spirit. It produces immature saints who become diaper dictators and pablum personalities. Wow, that was good. I don't think I thought that up. I must have stole that from somebody. Religion is intolerant to those who don't fit their form. <coughs> Our attitudes of intolerance or manifested in sustained stares and critical comments. Such religious reactions will destroy churches faster than a five-alarm fire. Paul rebuked the Galatians thoroughly for deserting Christ in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, for setting aside the grace of God in Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, and for becoming bewitched by legalism in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. But Jesus reserved his most scathing remarks, not for struggling, struggling sinners, but for religious legalists who pursued a form of godliness while denying the power of God. They were pompous peacocks, hypocrites, and glory hogs who had an inner compulsion to be the center of attention. Can I make a statement? Their descendants are still here. <laughs> so, if there is something within you that instinctively criticizes people who do not fit into your world, something that compels you to look down your nose at those who disagree with you, a compulsion for having your talents and your accomplishments on display all the time, you are in danger of becoming a modern-day Pharisee. And Pharisees are never happy. Have you ever noticed that? You study the scripture, Pharisees are always mad. They're mad at each other. They're mad at other people. They're mad at Jesus. They're mad at God. They're mad at Rome. They're mad at everybody. And their descendants in churches today are mad at everybody. Yeah, amen. So happiness is not found in the golden rule. Did you know that the golden rule is a fraud? I about got your attention there, didn't I? That, let, listen to me carefully. <clears throat> Without the character of Christ in the life of the person quoting the rule, there's no greater fraud on the face of the earth. You will never, ever, ever 
Believe in the golden rule enough to live by it until you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. For a lost man to quote the golden rule is a lie, is a fraud. Let me try to explain again what I mean by such a statement. The drunk who buys another drunk a drink is practicing the golden rule. Did you know that? Did, did you know that he's doing for another what he wants others to do for him? Have him get drunk. Hello? Likewise, the drug addict sharing a fix with another addict is practicing the golden rule without the character of Christ. And on and on and on. You see how, crippled, how hypocritical we are by trying to quote the golden rule without knowing Jesus? Luke chapter 6, verse 31, Jesus said, Do unto others as you would have them do to you. He was teaching that what has become known as this Beatitudes. And in that context, Jesus was giving instructions on allowing the love of God to flow through us to others. Our deeds are a reflection of our desires, which reflects our character. Our deeds are a reflection of our desires, which is a reflection of our character. We and we alone are responsible for our deeds. There comes a time in the life of each one of us when we must assume responsibility for who we are and what we do. We can blame your mama, your daddy, your professor, your boss, your preacher, or even God. But ladies and gentlemen, when you look in the mirror, you find your enemy. We're living in a time where we're hearing a lot of professionals use the term peer pressure. It is indeed true that many of our young people are under a great amount of peer pressure to participate in certain activities. We wear certain clothes, go to certain places, give in to certain temptations. While all of that is certainly true, it is still the responsibility of the person himself for the actions and the reactions that he makes. That same truth is found in the lives of adults. We have sought to cover up our lack of commitment to the Lord and church by blaming someone else instead of being honest with ourselves. We blame pastors, deacons, Sunday school teachers, and on and on and on. But listen, if you're not happy where you are, go somewhere else. You know what? You're probably not going to be happy there either. Are, are you listening to me? Yeah. I did a survey the other day not too long ago. We talked about it in our, one of our staff meetings some time back. I looked at a survey, tried to find out where the churches in Caldwell County came from. You know where churches in Caldwell County came from? Other churches. Hmm? They couldn't get along with each other, so they went and started a new church. Huh? If we don't like the music, we're going to start a church and have our own music. If we don't like the way you talk, we're going to start a church that talks like us. If we don't like the way you dress, we're going to start our own church. You can wear your rags. You, un you understand what I'm saying? Y'all listening to me? It's not the fact that we're willing to give to get along. We're unwilling to give if we have to hurt everybody around us. That is a sad habitat for the church. Isn't that right? Now, now, let me just be honest with you. If you left the church because you're unhappy, I'm glad you're here. Huh? Amen. Some of you left some church, you should have left a long time ago to get here. I'm just going to tell you right straight up. But I'm glad you're here. That same, that same truth is, there's, there's, we find, people try to find happiness in doing. What I mean by a statement like that? Well, it's simply this. I honestly think that many people are miserable and, and they are trying to find some comfort in the many involvements of life and religious activities. And the problem is, for soon, the doing becomes the problem because we're stressed out. Why? Because it presents a burden on our time, on our energy, and on our families. Happiness is not found in tomorrow. 
Much happiness is associated with waiting for tomorrow. How many times I've heard people postpone the joy of life saying something like this, I'll be happy when I get older. Then when they get older, everything hurts. And that doesn't hurt, doesn't work. I've heard people say, I'll be happy when I get married. And then I get married and discover that although ever, everybody gets married for better or for worse, sometimes got to worse. I'll be happy when I have children. Then they have children and discover that three ways to get something done. Do it yourself, hire somebody to do it, and forbid your kids from doing it. <laughs> then there are folks say, I'll be happy when I retire. And they find out that the only bad thing about doing nothing is you never get a day off. Today is tomorrow we talked about Yesterday. We are exchanging one day of our life for it. When the sun sets, what we have you to show for it. When the clock strikes midnight tonight, this day's gone. And at 1201, 12.1 second, tomorrow's here. Whatever you didn't accomplish today can never be accomplished today. And what you're waiting for today, you missed. Happiness is not found in religion. Happiness is not found in doing. Happiness is not found in tomorrow. Happiness is the result of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The truth of the matter is this. If you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you already have everything you need to have a joyful life. You are loved by a heavenly Father who has promised to supply all of your needs. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of your going to heaven. No wonder the Bible repeatedly commands us to be thankful. If you really want to be happy, learn to be thankful for whom you are in Christ Jesus and stop lusting after what you don't have. See, I told you I was going to be short tonight. <laughs> that's the introduction from there on it get long but uh, happiness well, let me tell you what I found out if you live a happy life you get on people's nerves <laughs> yeah 